What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to a audiobook for a book that isn't even out yet, which is crazy. Uh, this is the the first epilogue for Lally's Game, which is the first uh, book in the Tales from the Peterplex book set. Um, we have got a leak, basically. We have got all of the pages, so I'm going to be reading you, you them today. This is really exciting stuff, I'm telling you. So uh, let's get straight into this. Make sure that if you enjoy this video uh, and you want more uh, book stuff in the future, that you subscribe and you like the video, of course. And uh, yeah, let's go straight into it. First of all, I don't really know how to pronounce this name. I'm just going to say Gil. It could be Jill, but I'm going to say Gil. <laughs> Gil grunted as he struggled to free a battered metal endoskeleton from beneath the edge of the warped wooden stage. Sweat that saturated his hair and forehead dripped from his left eyebrow into his eye. The salty liquid stung. Gil swore, released his grip on the endoskeleton's ankle, and wiped his eye. We're never going to get out of here, Gil grumbled. He straightened and turned to survey the dingy ruins of the old pizzeria he and his co-workers were charged with renovating. Gil didn't know how old the place was, but it definitely had seen better days. It was filthy and littered with trash and scrap, most of which consisted of discarded animatronic endoskeletons, heavy metal robotic parts that were a bear to lift and transport. Gil was sick of dragging the things around. Gil reached for the water bottle he'd left on the edge of the stage. He took a swig and gazed at the seemingly endless work that lay ahead of him. Robotic endoskeletons the vaguely human skeleton-shaped steel frameworks over which all of Fazbear Enterprise's animatronics were built were piled everywhere. The place looked like the aftermath of a robotic Armageddon. What? <laughs> that sounds like the after amalgamation in some kind of way, or the agony. Uh, but probably not. Not only was that old pizzeria bulging, with discarded metal skeletons, it was also filled with broken down tables and chairs and red vinyl topped stools, stacks of wooden beams and cement blocks and piles of concrete and metal rubble. Weirdly bright blue and green and red plates and cups, um, along with purple striped tablecloths were strewn among the larger debris. This is freaking the a pizza place. <laughs> it has to be, right? This is a security breach book. We are in a pizzeria in the epilogues. This has to be the pizza place, I'm telling you. Um, yeah, let's continue. This part of the pizzeria was its main dining room, a large red-walled room dominated by a rectangular stage. Although the pizzeria's electrical systems were mostly shot and Gil and his teammates had to set up work lights around the room, the stage lights, for, no, for reasons no one understood, always shone brightly. A row of the round, piercing lights lined the front of the stage and also encircled a smaller, semicircular stage next to the large one. On either end of the big stage, more of the floodlights glared out from rows of old speakers that sat silently, their black surfaces obscured by who knew how many years of grime. Just as Gil set down his water bottle and prepared to, uh, to lean over the stuck endoskeleton, Danny, the eager beaver 20-year-old who drove Gil nuts with his constant cheerful chatter and isn't this fun attitude, crawled out from underneath the stage. Danny brought a cloud of dust with him. Gil wrinkled his nose at the fetid, fetid? What does that word mean? At the fetid smell that wafted from under the stage's cracked front skirting. Danny squirmed across the black and white checkered linoleum floor and scooted away from the stage. He held the end of a rope that was tied to another endoskeleton and dragged the broken down robotic frame behind him. It slid out easily, not caught on anything like the one Gil was dealing with. This is the last one from way under the stage, Danny said. It's so cool under there. Cool? Gil curled his lip. Only if you like filth and cobwebs. He snorted and waved a hand to indicate the whole room they were in. There's nothing cool about this place. Danny sprang to his feet. He brushed off his perfectly creased khakis and his equally perfectly pressed denim shirt. Um... Who ironed a denim shirt, Gil wondered. Danny looked and acted like a mama's boy. 
His precisely combed blonde hair and too cute face went with his merry attitude, his stories about his beloved mother and his obsession with following rules. Even though Gil was just a few years older than Danny, Gil thought of Danny as a kid. Gil was Danny's opposite, since he never wrote, uh, wait, wore anything, sorry, it's hard to see. Since he never wore anything but jeans and t-shirts, Gil had never ironed a thing in his 24 years on the planet. He didn't even like his mom, and he avoided rules like the plague. Gil also would never be described as cute. He liked to think of himself as rugged and bad. Gil was one of those guys women claimed to hate but secretly wanted. They couldn't resist his shaggy brown hair, unshaven face, and brooding dark brown eyes. Gil shook his head. This job wouldn't be over fast enough to suit him, and not just because of working with guys like Danny. There's too much work here for just the four of us, Gil said. He looked across the room toward the other two men on the renovation team. Owen and Carlo were working together to add yet another endoskeleton to a growing stack near the only exit from the old pizzeria. Guys, I'm in for naff. <laughs> All the other doors and windows in the place were obstructed by heavy lumber and cement blocks. No way we're going to get everything done by the deadline they've given us, Gil continued. The suits have no idea how hard it is to break down these things. Gil gestured toward the endoskeleton Danny was now dragging across the floor. If you'd stop complaining so much, the work would go a lot faster, Danny said. Gil gave Danny a dirty look, which Danny ignored. Danny kept talking. These endoskeletons are fascinating, he said, and we're getting good exercise. It's like being paid to work out. He flexed an admittedly impressive bicep and grinned. Plus, I think it's great how we're going to renovate this place back to how it was in its heyday. I heard they're thinking about not only sprucing it up and preserving it, but maybe even memorializing it, like turning it into a museum or something. I think it's awesome that they're building the new Pizzaplex above this old place. It's really an honor to be a part of this kind of project. That's interesting. See, that I think that's interesting because that, okay, first of all, that definitely confirms that this is the pizza place we're talking about. I mean, if the decorations didn't tell you that already, then this definitely does. But um, I think it's, that's funny how they, they were planning to like make it a tourist attraction. That's interesting to me. They, they weren't just trying to cover up, like, the past. They, they were genuinely making it into, like, an attraction, which is kind of bad. <laughs> it's kind of bad knowing what happened there. Anyway, uh, Gil rolled his eyes and turned his back on Danny. I'm going outside to get some fresh air, Gil said. But you just took a break about 15 minutes ago, Danny said. Yeah, well, I'm taking another one. Deal with it. Gil headed toward the old pizzeria's only exit. Watching a downpour so heavy it looked like a grey curtain instead of individual water drops, Theo huddled next to his co-worker and friend. I can't see that name. Bryi? That's a strange name. Oh, Bryce. Bryce. It's Bryce. It's not Bryi. I thought that was an E. Uh, a tall, skinny guy who was a lot stronger than he looked. They both were attempting to shelter under metal scaffolding, which wasn't up to the task of keeping them dry. Rain spattered Theo's heavy work boots as he frowned at the big delivery truck that was backing toward him with a shrill beep, beep, beep that cut through the crackling and drumming sounds of the rain. Theo coughed and turned away from the truck's smelly exhaust. Bryce covered his nose and shook his head. What's with the delivery? Bryce asked. We haven't even enclosed anything yet. Theo shrugged. He and Bryce had been part of the construction team working on Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizzaplex for several years, or several weeks, sorry, long enough for Theo to learn that asking questions was never a good idea. Theo thought that a lot of what went on at the Pizzaplex was strange, like building a modern equipment uh, entertainment complex over the remains of an old pizzeria, for instance. Uh, but Theo didn't care. The pay was great, and the gig was a long one. Uh, even after all this time, the Pizzaplex was still in its fledging stage. It currently looked like a giant dome-shaped metal cage. Theo and his team, and all the other workers on the project, were just finishing up setting the rebar and concrete that would make up the skeletal structure of the building. The truck came to a stop, and a big curly-haired guy jumped out of the cab. Sheltering a clipboard under a lightweight jacket, 
that was rain saturated within seconds. The man ran towards Theo and Bryce. Theo stepped back to make room for the man who smelled of sweat and spearmint. The man, popping the gum he chewed vigorously, nod nodded a thanks and shook himself like a dog. Theo and Bryce were both sprayed. Theo pointed at the man's clipboard. Do I need to sign? The man nodded and presented the clipboard to Theo. A gust of wind blew the rain under the scaffolding and the paper on the clipboard fluttered. Theo quickly scammed, sc sorry, scanned the wet paper. He raised an eyebrow. State of the art animatronics? Bryce was right. It was weird to be receiving these now when the building was a little more than an open framework. But Theo had been told that his team was supposed to receive and unload this shipment. So he signed the delivery order. Thanks, the big man said. He popped his gun, turned, and ran back toward the truck's cab. He tossed the clipboard inside, then trotted to the back of the truck. This, the man flipped a big metal latch. It made a metallic thunk. Then he threw up the door, which ratcheted open with a series of squeaks and thuds. The man stepped back under the scaffolding. Together, he and Theo and Bryce looked into the back of the truck. Bryce gasped. Whoa! The man said. He stopped chewing his gum. Theo frowned. The delivery order said new state-of-the-art animatronics, he pointed. So what happened to that one? The man shook his head. He strode forward and jumped up into the back of the truck. Theo exchanged a look with Bryce, then followed the man. Bryce stayed where he was. The inside of the truck was dark and smelled like sawdust and motor oil. Rain pounding on the truck's metal roof was amplified in the small space. It sounded like several people were banging on the top of the truck with hammers. Um, Theo and the truck driver studied a collection of friendly looking animatronics. Theo's gaze shifted from one robot to the next. All of them were gleaming in brand new perfection. All of them except one. This animatronic was anything but bright and shiny and friendly looking. What could have done this? Theo asked. The truck driver shook his head and shuffled his feet nervously. I got no idea. Theo shook his head. Well, they're going to need another guitarist. Hmm. As soon as the back of the truck opened up, Gil left the shelter of the cement half wall where he'd like to take his breaks. The wall was a few feet from the exterior framework uh, of the Peterplex, and none of the construction workers had a problem with them with him hanging out there. Now, though, Gil stepped up beside the tall, thin guy who waited under the scaffolding. The guy didn't notice Gil at first. He was looking toward the big truck driver and the other guy, a broad-shouldered 30-something man with a receding hairline. Actually, the tall guy was looking beyond the driver and the prematurely balding man, he was looking at the stripped-down robot. Uh, Gil looked at the robot, too. Grinning, he dashed through the rain and hopped up into the back of the truck. Hey, Gil stuck out a hand toward the guy with too much forehead. Gil. Theo. Theo shook Gil's hand, but he was frowning, clearly wondering what Gil was doing there. I'm part of the Renault crew, Gil explained. He pointed at the bare endoskeleton. I'll take that one. Theo cocked his head. Gil didn't give Theo a chance to form a question. Gil stepped toward the seven-foot metal skeleton. He gripped its arm. This obviously isn't going to be used for whatever those are for. He gestured at the new, undamaged animatronics. But it looks strong and sturdy. I think I can repurpose it and use it to break down and pile up all the heavy, trashed endoskeletons that we're trying to clear out of the old pizzeria. I don't think... Theo began. Gil bumped Theo, forcing him to step back. Theo frowned but didn't stop Gil as he tipped the bare endoskeleton forward and began dragging it across the aluminium truck, truck bed. The metal on metal screech weird, weird, yeah. <laughs> with the reins continued dribbling, dribbling. Gil made sure the endoskeleton brushed against Theo and he grinned when Theo jumped back even further. Gil knew his six foot two frame and his just try me face would be enough to intimidate Theo into silence, just to be sure. He glared a challenge at Theo. Theo raised both hands in a gesture of surrender. Have at it, Theo said. Gil jumped out into the rain and dragged his prize off the truck. 
By the time Gil managed to drag the endoskeleton into the old pizzeria, he was panting and sweating heavily, but he didn't care. This thing was going to make Gil's life much, much easier. Gil laid the robot against one of the side walls of the pizzeria's dining room. He straightened and wiped his face with the back of his hand. What the heck are you doing? Carlo stepped up beside Gil and scowled at the bare bones robot. He too wiped his face. His dark skin glistened with sweat and moisture beaded up on the oak leaf tattoo on his forearm. We're supposed to be getting them out, not bringing them in. Gil looked down at Carlo and clapped the short but sturdy guy on the back. This is going to do exactly that. Carlo frowned in confusion. Gil laughed. He looked at the stripped down animatronic. Stay there, he said to the robot. I'll be right back. Gil ignored Carlo's baffled and exasperated look and strode across the room to what used to be the arcade part of the pizzeria. In the narrow aisles between dark and broken arcade games, Gil and his co-workers left their personal belongings during the day. The old pizzeria's employee area was too filled with rubbish to use, and the temporary trailers set up outside the pizzeria's construction zone were earmarked for the construction crew, not the, renova the renovation crew. Of course, the renovation crew was treated like second-class citizens, but not for long. Gil was going to change that. Gil found his backpack next to Danny's shiny red lunch pail. Danny was such a little boy, and he quickly reached into it and pulled out his laptop. Finally, Gil was going to show the suits they'd been wrong to stick him on this crew, doing the grunt work. When Gil had applied for a job at the Pizzaplex, he'd thought he'd be chosen as part of the tech team. He didn't have any actual work experience as a programmer, but he tinkered with programs and robotics all the time at home. He told the suits what an asset he'd be, but they didn't believe him, and he'd ended up down in his hole, dragging around old dead robots, but not anymore. Gil hurried back to the prone endoskeleton. Carlo had moved off. He and Owen were now struggling to break down one of the endoskeletons stacked by the stage. Owen's bowling ball round face was flushed red with exertion. Suckers, Gil muttered. He opened his laptop and set it on the floor. Then he knelt next to his new worker robot. Whereas the endoskeletons Gil and his teammates had been hauling and dismantling were just metal versions of, an, of a human skeletal system, this endoskeleton was more substantial. It wasn't just a basic metal structure. Its steel frame was contained within a bulging collection of metal rods and curved plates and an impressive system of balls, ball joints and pistons. All of this was topped with a long, vaguely rectangular-shaped shiny steel skull. That was a really difficult sentence to say. The skull was the only part of the endoskeleton that was shiny. The rest was dark and discoloured, as if it had somehow survived some kind of fire. Wink wink. The upper part of the shiny skull contained bulging white eyes encased in steel sockets, and the lower part contained a hinged metal toothed mouth. Jutting from the top of the head, a pair of bent metal ears stuck out like antennae. Um, all I'll say about this is a lot of people have been saying this is burn trap. Um, I see why people think that, but I'm kind of scared to make that judgment straight away just because, you know, we all thought that the, 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 we all thought that the Stitch Wraith at first was Ennard, but of course the Stitch Wraith is a completely separate character. He's got nothing to do with Ennard. So like, I don't want to make a judgment way too quickly, especially when this is the first epilogue of maybe 12 again, or 11. Anyway, uh, continuing. Feeling around the back of the base of the metallic skull, Gil found a small switch. He pressed it, and the robot's jaw shifted forward with a faint whir. The jaw clicked into a full open position, revealing a mass of circuits, chips, and wires within the skull. Gil probed the wires and found the one that had a power coupler. He gently pulled it out and connected it with his laptop. As soon as the animatronic was linked to Gil's computer, its specs and operating system code uh, scrolled down the laptop screen. Gil leaned forward and scanned the code. When he saw what he was looking for, he reached out and tapped a few keys. Cleanup protocol. Check. Gil's face shifted from his laptop to the robot and back again to the screen. After a few seconds, the screen prompted, Protocol uploaded. Gil discon disconnected 
his laptop from the robot. He started to reach for the animatronic jaw, but he paused when a shadow fell over his keyboard. He looked up. Danny, looking as clean and fresh as he had at the start of the day, was staring at the endoskeleton. What are you doing? Danny asked. I didn't think any of these things worked. This is a new one, Gil said. I've activated a cleanup protocol. Gil reached out and pushed the robot's jaw back into place. As soon as the whir and click ended, the white eyes glowed orange. The robot's joints hummed and hissed as it sat up. Danny yelped. Gil grinned when Danny took several stutter steps backward. Out of the corner of his eye, Gil saw Carlo and Owen join Danny. They all goggled at the animatronic. With a rumbling chur, the robot turned its head and looked directly at Gil. The square metal-toothed mouth emitted a metallic rasp as it hinged open. Awaiting instructions, the robot said in a flat, deep voice. That wasn't very deep, was it? <laughs> cool, Danny said. Gil turned to grin at the kid. He chuckled when he saw that Owen and Carlo were sliding away. Or siddling away, not sliding. Uh, Gil turned back to his new robot. He leaned in and looked at the robot in its radiant eyes. I want you to break the limbs and heads off of all of that endoskeletons in this place and pile them up over there. He pointed toward the pile of animatronic parts by the exit door. Easy peasy, got it? The robot's internal mechanisms ca crackled and groaned. The robot's mouth creaked as it opened again. Break off limbs and heads. Pile them up. Easy peasy, got it? The robot looked directly at Gil for several seconds. Uh, Gil shook off a sudden shiver. The robot's glow-eyed gaze was creepy, but then the animatronic couldn't help that it didn't have a face. Oh, interesting. That's why people think it might be burn trap in some kind of way, because like Man in Room 1280. We still don't know how that like fits in, if that's all stitch line. Anyway, uh, I'll talk about that in another theory video. Uh, the robot's joints clicked and its servos droned as it abruptly rose to its feet. Once upright, its hard metal edges reflected the stage lights behind it, making it look like it was radiating heat. To disguise as unbidden flinch, I don't know what that means, uh, Gil quickly stood, too. You can start by taking inventory, Gil said to the robot. The robot shifted its feet as if finding its balance. Something ticked into place in its midsection. Other robotic parts clack, clicked, clacked, and thrummed. These are weird words. The animatronic's eyes pulsed with luminescence as it slowly and deliberately turned to scan the room. It rotated in a full circle, its gaze taking in all the robotic remains scattered throughout the space. When the robot finished its rotation, its attention zeroed in on Gil and the other team members. The robot took a step forward, its heavy steel foot grating across the bare floor. The robot's eerie eyes locked on Gil, then looked on to Danny and then on to Owen and finally on to Carlo. Gil Shiver returned. Um, he glanced over at the others. Danny's eager expression had collapsed into nervousness. He exchanged a look with Carlo, whose forehead was bunched into a worried frown. Owen wore a pinched expression that could have been annoyance or fear or both. Gil had to admit he found the robot's scrutiny a little upsetting. A barely discernible wheezing sound was coming from the animatronic systems. Gil wasn't sure what the sound meant. Was everything functioning properly? When the newly animated endoskeleton took a step, Gil nearly jumped out of his skin. He pretended that he'd just tripped over something and he stepped aside as the robot strode past him. Gil was embarrassed by his reaction, but he immediately let himself off the hook. The new endoskeleton, after all, was huge, much bigger than the five and six footers Gil and his co-workers had been dragging along for so long. It was reasonable for Gil's fight or flight response to be triggered in the face of that kind of power, but there was no need for concern. The new robot was under Gil's control. Gil joined his team members as the robot, its systems grinding, uh, walked over to the nearest endoskeleton and picked it up as if it was made of flimsy fabric. Uh, effortlessly, the new cleanup robot snapped the endoskeleton's shoulder joints. The endoskeleton's arms came free. The robot tossed their arms aside. They landed on the floor with a skittering clatter. The robot did the same thing with the endoskeleton's legs, cracking the limbs from the hip joints and flinging them toward the arms. The metal arms and legs clanged in a tangle as if the big robot grabbed the endoskeleton's head and popped it off. 
grasping their head between its huge metal hands, the cleanup robot rolled the skull toward the discarded limbs. As soon as the skull stopped moving, the robot lifted the remaining torso. Stumping heavily across the black and white checkered linoleum, the robot carried the torso to the pile of limbs and dropped it. The torso landed with a crunch and bang as, a, as the efficient new robot turned and headed toward another endoskeleton. Over the next couple minutes, the new robot made quick work of three more endoskeletons. The robot had no problem deconstructing the, irredi or the already partly broken endoskeletons and adding them to the growing pile by the door. Is this a blob origin story? That's kind of cool if it is. Gil turned away from the robot. He beamed at his co-workers. See, I'm a genius. He threw his arms up in triumph. Danny's mum had taught him to accept and respect all people, even the unpleasant ones. Danny didn't much like Gil, but he pretended that he did. And now he had to admit that Gil had done something pretty amazing. Even though Gil was bragging, which was something Danny had been taught not to do ever, Gil had reason to be pleased with himself. Danny opened his mouth to agree with Gil's self-assessment. But he never got the words out. What happened next stole his words, and some of his sanity as well. It happened so fast that it all melded together into one impossible horror that Danny's mind struggled to put into order. The robot looming, a blur of metallic motion, a squelching pop, Gil's eater-walling scream. Danny's mind computed the events. Gil was screaming because he no longer had arms. The robot had ripped off Gil's arms. Oh god. As the robot hurled Gil's arms toward the pile of robotic parts by the pizzeria's exit door, the air left Danny's lungs and the strength fled his legs. Danny staggered backward, his heart pounding. Not believing what he was seeing, he stared at gushing fountains of red spraying from Gil's shoulder sockets. Beside Danny, Carlo cried out. Danny glanced toward the other two men. Owen made no sound, but his face was white. His eyes were nearly bugging out of his face. Gil continued to scream. No, not scream. Shriek. Wail. Keen. The sounds Gil made were unlike anything Danny had ever heard. Those sounds were accompanied by sickening cracking and crunching sounds. And even under all of that hideous racket, Danny could hear the wet slap of blood hitting the walls and the floor. Another wrenching crunch turned Danny's thoughts into a crazed, fearful babble especially when the crunch cut off Gil's screams completely. The crunch, which was like the twisting snap of a screw being shorn free of its housing, silenced Gil in a fraction of a second. One instant, the old pizzeria had echoed with the, pu uh, with the peals of Gil's pain. The next, the high-pitched howls were gone. Now, all Danny could hear was his own and, his other and the other's staccato breathing, he also heard the metallic clanks and whirs of the robot, which was now heading their way. Danny, Carlo and Owen turned as one. They started to run toward the pizzeria's only exit. Before they took even a step though, several construction workers poured through the open doorway, tearing into the old pizzeria. Danny and his teammates were caught between the advancing robot and the converging workers. What's going on down here? One of the men called out. We heard screams and the man, a long haired, muscle-bound bald guy Danny had seen around a few times stopped talking when his gaze landed on a bloody carnage that used to be Gil. His eyes bulged. Run! Carlo yelled. Danny was already running. Careening through the confused and shocked men, Danny bounced off meaty arms and... Oh wait, yeah, bounced off meaty arms and paunchy bellies as if he was a pinball in one of the old arcade machines. The room was a chaos of sound and motion. Danny's senses couldn't even process it. At, he couldn't even process it all. He only got disjointed impressions as he ran. Danny's ears registered metallic clanks, squishy thuds, more cracks and snaps and pops, wet splashes, bellows and cries and shouts. His mind didn't even try to translate what he was hearing into actual events. He didn't want to think about it. A stream of vicious bread, uh, of <laughs> vicious bread, vicious red spewed across one of the white squares on the floor ahead of Danny. His eyes took in a galloping red-headed worker, a press of chests and faces, blanched bone white, uh, and a ripped off arm. The dark skin and small oak leaf tattoo told him that the arm had belonged to Carlo. When a round head tumbled across the floor in front of Danny and a, gasp, a grasping metal hand swiped his way, 
Danny darted to his left and dove between the legs of one of the panicked construction workers. More body parts flew past, more blood sprayed. Danny ran through a cacophony of hysteria, and everything Danny had ever learnt about being polite and following the rules and respecting others was deconstructed along with the men around him. He cared about nothing but getting out of the pizzeria turned abattoir. Oh my gosh. Danny dodged and dove and scrambled and flailed, and he finally reached the door. As he galloped through it, he looked back. The butchery continued. The tortured cries crescendoed. Danny blanched. And he slammed the door. Danny kept running, past piles of lumber and stacks of rebar, past more converging construction workers, and then he ran past a rumbling cement truck, its mixing drum rotating, the grey sludge of wet cement sluicing, I don't know that word, from its discharge suit. Shoot. Uh, Danny screamed at the men spreading the poured cement. Seal it! Even shouting at the top of his lungs. Danny's words could barely be heard above the cement truck's roar and the screams that reached out from the pizzeria and curled into Danny's brain like a vine wrapping around his consciousness. Seal the door! Danny screamed louder. He pointed back toward the entry to the pizzeria. The cement workers finally looked up. They turned and looked toward the pizzeria door. Seal it! Danny cried out again and he kept running. That is an amazing first epilogue. Um, that is incredible because it's like, it, oh my god, it sets up a lot and it just shows that this endoskeleton is just pure evil. That I think that is why people think it is Afton and it probably is to be honest. But uh, I, I would like it to be a new character. It would be cool if it was a new uh, custom, uh, you know, epilogue character. Anyway, tell me guys what you think of this. Any theories as well, because this seems to be very lore heavy. So uh, tell me what you think, and uh, I will see you later. Goodbye.